Welcome back to another episode of Ramiumptum Ruminations. I'm the host, Scott. Today's episode is a continuation of the the October 2021 General Conference Review. Today's episode is the Saturday afternoon session. Thanks for coming back for another episode. This one, as I said in the title, is a recap of the Saturday afternoon session of the October 2021 General Conference. Before I get too far into this, I wanted to talk about something that I struggle to find the right words to express how I feel around General Conference time. As I was going and listening, because I, I listened to these after, the, after they aired, because In the weekend that they all came out, I didn't have the time to set aside the 10 hours that you need to set aside to listen to General Conference. I actually spent most of that Saturday at the pumpkin patch with my kids. They're still little. For my family, the time is spent better making memories as a family. And my spouse, as a nuanced believing member, she's able to listen to them and read the talks at her leisure. And it it works well for our family. So we actually spent most of Saturday at the pumpkin patch with the kids. As I was coming home from the pumpkin patch, it was in the evening that day, my father reached out to me. And one of the things in our family is we would always reach out to each other before priesthood session, no matter where we were in the world to basically do a roll call to make sure that we were all still attending. As a believer, I thought it was really cool. I enjoyed these talks, these, you know, these reminder texts that we all send each other, my brothers and I and my father. I recognize that the fact that I don't attend or believe anymore is affecting my father because he, he reached out that evening before the session started and the tone of his the tone of our conversation was was sad as if there was a loss because of the change and from his perspective there was this got me thinking quite a bit i see i can i look back and i see these text conversations that we had this roll call that we kept in our family as another way that we as a family kept each other more ingrained in the church. But at the same time, it was the way that we as brothers connected to each other. And since I've left, I no longer have that connection with them. And frankly, for some of them, it was the only connection I had with them. It's a bittersweet feeling when I look back at a lot of these emotions and a lot of the things that I used to do. Because part of me wants to connect with my brothers in a better way than I do today. But I I don't know if I'll ever have that back because I can't I can't go and be a different person than I am. And I can't go and change to a previous version of myself. Anyway, I'm rambling and I've been asked, why would someone who doesn't believe spend the time to go through all of these sessions or review and talk about them in in depth and at length? I didn't want these episodes, I didn't want these reviews to be longer than the actual general conference sessions. I've tried to keep them fairly concise. But what could a non-believer take from general conference both positive and negative i think that it's unhealthy for a post mormon or an ex mormon to watch conference with the sole objective of finding things that are wrong or waiting to be offended i'm not saying that the church doesn't say offensive things over the pulpit 
But if the only motive to listen is to find those things, then you're setting yourself up for pain unnecessarily. And maybe, maybe it would be healthier to leave it behind. Now for me, I'm going into this and I'm, I'm trying my hardest to have an open mind and I've tried to have a, a neutral, balanced approach to these talks up until this point. And for the most part, the talks in this session, I don't have much criticism to say, but there is one that irked me and I'll probably spend more time talking about that one. Let's jump into this. I, I apologize for ranting about my, <laughs> my own personal experience for a minute there. I apologize. But let's go into this. The first talk was uh, President M. Russell Ballard. It, he called it, Lovest Thou Me More Than These? And I'm really not going to go too far into this one. I will say this. The concept that he's putting forward is he's, he's talking about all of the other things in our life that we put before Christ. The only thing I really want to say about this is this concept was a factor in the scrupulosity that I experienced as a believer. The way that members are encouraged to overanalyze every minute detail of their lives to make sure that everything is lined up with the church, that was really unhealthy for me. Now, I recognize that that's other people can read and take these things and not incorporate them in their lives in an unhealthy way, but that wasn't the way I experienced it. And so talks like this are a little hard because it reminds me of some of the thought patterns that I had when I was a believing member of the church. That's all I'm going to say about that. Nothing new was presented. So the second talk was the third female speaker of the October 2021 General Conference. This was Sharon Eubank. She's the first counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency. And her talk is called, I Pray He'll Use Us. She starts off her talk by telling a story of a family that was uh, in need and how they gave back to the church by sending in some baked goods to the church. Not very far into her talk, she starts talking about the many things that the church does as their responsibility to take care of the poor all over the world. She says that the church of Jesus Christ is under a divine mandate to care for the poor. There's lots of references in the scriptures that talk about this. Uh, an important one would probably be Doctrine and Covenants 104, 11 through 18. It talks about um, taking care of the poor and the needy. 18 specifically says, Therefore, if any man shall take of the abundance which I have made, and impart not his portion according to the law of my gospel unto the poor and the needy, he shall, with the wicked, lift up his eyes in hell, being in torment. Th that wasn't what she cited. This is me citing the scriptures, so I just wanted to make that clear. But she's talking about the fact that the church has been instructed through their scriptures to take care of the poor and the needy. She goes through and she starts listing a number of things that the church does. And here's the list that she says. The church responds to this charge in a wide variety of ways, including the ministering we do through relief society, priesthood quorums and classes, fasting and the use of fast offerings, welfare farms and canneries, welcome centers for immigrants, outreach for those in prison, church humanitarian efforts, and the Just Serve app, which, where it's available that matches volunteers with service opportunities. These are all ways organized through the priesthood where small efforts collectively make a big impact, magnifying the many individual things we do as the disciples of Christ. She actually explained my criticism with this really well here. She says, where these small efforts collectively make a big impact. I think the local efforts that the church makes in its areas are good. They're great, even. But the church as a whole is taking credit for these local efforts in a way that I don't think matches with what the church should be doing. As she, as she mentioned, the church is under a divine mandate to take care of the poor. So according to their scripture, Doctrine and Covenants 104, 11 through 18, if you've been given abundance, 
you have to take care of the poor. According to the law of the gospel, you have to take care of the poor is, is basically what that verse says. I've gone into it in a lot of other places. Lots of other podcasters have talked about this. It's, it's something that's on the minds of many people that have left. I'm going to talk about two numbers, then I'm just going to drop the subject. The first number I want to talk about, we know that in the Ensign Peak Advisors Incorporated, which is the church's investment division, it was founded in like the 1960s. In 2020, the accounts that it managed were in the ballpark of $140 billion. They also own, you know, large tracts of land all over all over the globe at very expensive temples. The Deseret Cattle and Citrus Ranch in East Orlando, Florida is the world's largest beef ranch. The last time that there was like a good valuation of the land was back in like 1997. And it was valued at 858 million. So just shy of a billion. I'd imagine that in the last 20 years, it's gone up since then. Let's just say that the church total assets are in the ballpark of 140 billion. We'll just put that out there. It's probably a lot more than that because of the land assets that they have all over the globe. But we'll just say $140 billion. The next number I want to examine is the cost of ending world hunger. Now, there's a lot of different studies that have been done on this. Lots of different numbers have been thrown out as far as how much it would cost to end world hunger. And the cost per year, if you will, ranges anywhere from $7 billion per year to upwards a couple of articles that I read were 300 billion per year ballpark for how much it would cost to end world hunger. The numbers that are giving lower estimates, these ones are typically saying how much it would cost to just feed these people. The higher numbers that I read, those were more focused on developing these countries and developing the world in a way where it would be sustainable and it would establish systems where world hunger just wouldn't exist anymore. These much higher numbers, it's establishing a system where world hunger just wouldn't exist anymore. And the lower numbers, it's typically looking at ways to end hunger just by feeding people. If we just take the $7 billion number and say that's what it's going to cost to feed every person on the planet, and reducing mal malnutrition, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints could afford that $7 billion by itself every year for the foreseeable future and never run into problems financially. If we're looking at the larger number, the 265 to you know plus billion per year, it would be something they would have to do as a combined effort with another faith, another religion. The point I want to make is this. The church claims to be doing a lot and taking care of the poor, and helping those in need. They make this claim, but they can't back it up when you look at it in any rational way. The people that make the claim that, oh, they're saving it for a rainy day fund, they're ignoring what Sister Sharon Eubank said, and what the scriptures say, and the example of Christ, frankly. The church sets up this idea of, if you have the means to take care of other people, then help them. But then it doesn't do it itself. She finished it off by citing examples and things across the globe that the church is doing. But again, it's not doing anywhere near the good that it could be doing if it used these finances in a way that would benefit the world. The next speaker was Elder Brent H. Nielsen. It's the talk called, Is There No Balm in Gilead? I don't have a ton really to say about this one. Kind of the a reader's died, uh, you know, a, a short description of what he's talking about is um, he's going through the, the healing power of the Savior and how, it, you know, the, the priesthood is able to heal our bodies. But a more important thing that the Savior can do for us is to heal our hearts. And he shares some some examples. And, and for people that do find value in belief in Christ, I think his talk is great. It did a great job of, of explaining how you can have faith in Christ and how it can help you heal and become a better person. In this talk, he gives an example of his own father who um, they 
tried to give a blessing to to, to heal him, but he ended up passing away. And he talked about how their faith in Christ is what helped heal their hearts to make them get better after this. The next speaker was Elder Arnulfo Valenzuela of the Quorum of the Seventy. His talk is called Deepening Our Conversion to Jesus Christ. And he he goes through a number of scriptures, talks about you know, the spiritual gifts of God and how members of the church often take those for granted. I do want to bring up one thing from this talk that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I don't think it was a terrible talk in itself. Some truth claims that I disagree with, but overall just talking about becoming a better person. About halfway through his talk, he relates a story that just... <sighs> I'll read his words, and then I'll talk about what I thought of it. He said, One afternoon, my wife and I were invited to a home of of a friend. Their seven-year-old son, David, had never heard of the Bible story of David and Goliath, and he wanted to hear it. As I began to tell the story, he was touched by the way David, with his faith, and in the name of the God of Israel, wounded and killed the Philistine with a sling and a stone, having no sword in his hand. Looking at me with his enormous dark eyes, he asked me firmly, Who is God? And I explained to him that God is our Heavenly Father, and that we learn about him in the scriptures. Then he asked me, What are the scriptures? I told him that the scriptures are the word of God, and that in them he would find beautiful stories that would help him to better know God. I asked his mother to use the Bible that she had in her home, and that she not let David go to sleep without reading the whole story to him. He was delighted as he listened to it. The scriptures and our knowledge of God are gifts, gifts that we too often take for granted. Let us cherish these blessings. At face value, it's a story of someone helping teach a friend's kid about God. For me, the important part is this. It's clear that this child or this family either belongs to a religion that doesn't believe in the same God that that the Abrahamic religions do, or their family is atheist or agnostic somewhere else on the belief spectrum, if you will. The kid asked Elder uh, Balenzuela, he asked him who God was. That stood out to me as a red flag. So I'm going to flip the script a little bit and retell the story in a way that might make a Mormon feel uncomfortable. What if someone else had gone into Elder Valenzuela's home and said something along the lines of this? Did you ever hear the story of when the Buddha shared tangerines with the children? You've never heard of the Buddha? Well, let me tell you who the Buddha was. Let me tell you some of the teachings of the Buddha. Or you could insert any other religion. You don't know anything about Hinduism or Taoism or Confucianism? Well, let me tell you about some of these religions. If someone from another faith came into your home and started teaching your seven-year-old child about their faith, and I think that most members of the church would be upset if someone came to them and started teaching their children a faith system that wasn't what their parents were trying to give them. That would make many parents very upset. And then his call on the mother to read the scriptures to her to her child every night, the arrogance of the church is on full display in a story like this. The next speaker is everybody's favorite, Bradley R. Wilcox. His talk was called Worthiness is Not Flawlessness. He is uh, currently the second counselor in the Young Men's General Presidency. Now, at face value, the, the bullet point version, if you will, of this talk sounds like it's moving in the right direction, but the way it's presented is, is still toxic perfectionism. He, he talks about, um, in, in this one, he goes over the fact that everyone makes mistakes. Everyone's going to feel like they, they've failed too many times. And he's trying to make the point that Christ's atonement make it possible for pe- people to enact significant change in their lives. Here's one of the lines that 
that uh, he said in this one. It says, some mistakenly receive the message that they are not worthy to participate fully in the gospel because they are not completely free of bad habits. God's message is that worthiness is not flawlessness. Worthiness is being honest and trying. We must be honest with God, priesthood leaders, and others who love us. And we must strive to keep God's commandments and never give up just because we slip up. The elephant in the room that he does address later is pornography specifically. On one hand, I like what he's trying to say. That it's it's kind of this idea that the process is more important than than where you are currently, as long as you're trying to be a better person and trying to make changes in your life. That's more important than any current mistakes that you're making. I disagree with what they define as a mistake or a sin. That's their prerogative to define what sin is. They're a church, they're a religion. I can disagree with that, but that's not going to change their minds. There is an important contradiction here, though. Too many scriptures talk about the fact that you cannot, that no unclean thing can dwell in the presence of God. So there is already so much toxic perfectionism built into Christianity and Mormonism. It's going to take a lot to change that sort of a mentality that is so deep rooted in Christianity as a whole. He then cites the story of some a young man he knew who struggled with pornography and he talked about how he talked about how this young man felt like he was a hypocrite because he was trying to change and break these habits, but he couldn't break them. He felt like a hypocrite practicing the religion, but not practicing it all the way because he was unable to kick this pornography habit that he had. What the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints classifies as a pornography habit is nothing out of the ordinary for anyone else in the entire world, and it would not be considered an addiction by any stretch of the imagination. It is a talk that he's trying to alter the way Mormons perceive mistakes and sins, shift the emphasis more on making the changes to become a better person. I think it's an important change. They miss the mark. They miss the mark completely because they're trying to make a change like this, but the theology is built around toxic perfectionism. Brother Wilcox here is trying to do something good. At the end of his talk, he brings up the important aspect of this that they're not addressing. It's the elephant in the room again that they're not touching. He cites the young women and ironic priesthood themes. And he says, he says, as I strive to serve, exercise faith, repent and improve each day, I will qualify to receive temple blessings and then the enduring joy of the gospel. The point about this that he doesn't touch on, in which I feel is why he doesn't stick the landing on this one, is because he put it's right there in that, that second half of this of this phrase that he says that they are striving to receive temple blessings. A person that struggles with something like this, and I say struggles with parentheses because it's not a struggle, it is a natural impulse, and there is nothing wrong with it. The standard of worthiness is to get a temple recommend and go to the temple to receive exaltation. No matter how encouraging or helpful they try and make this sound, there is a metric that if you don't qualify for, you will not get into heaven. So if someone who cannot kick a habit that they're trying to kick, they're going to hear a talk like this and maybe feel relieved for a minute or two. But then the very next time these unrealistic expectations are put on them they're going to jump they're going to dive right back into that cycle of despair that this sort of a theology brings so i i think what they're trying to accomplish is good but they're not going to get there because the way that the theology is built it engenders this sort of an attitude in a lot of people the next speaker in the saturday evening session was elder alfred kiyunga kiyungu of the 70. His talk was called be, To Be a Follower of Christ. That was basically all that he talked about. He talked about uh, Saul of Tarsus and later becoming Paul 
and how patterning your life after Christ will help you to become a better person. And this, even though I, I'm not a believer in Christ as a savior of the world, I think that someone who studies the teachings of Christ, the things that he said, and looks at the humanitarian aspects of his ministry, I think there's a lot of good that can be taken from someone who tries to pattern their life after Christ. So I'm in agreement with him there. Don't have a ton to criticize with this. One of the things that I do notice a lot with some of the speakers that are from the 70, you'll see them quoting from the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and the Prophet. And it's interesting to me that the only people that really quote prophets and apostles that have passed away are the current prophets and apostles. Basically, everyone else will only quote the living prophets and apostles. And perhaps there's some interpretation you can take from that, but that's something that I've noticed. The next speaker in the Saturday evening session was Elder Marcus B. Nash of the 70. His talk is called Hold Up Your Light. And the focus of this one was sharing your gospel. The Hold Up Your Light is a reference to Matthew 5, 15 and 16. Let your light so shine. He starts off his talk with an interesting discussion that may or may not have happened between him and an atheist on an airplane. I'll read it just because I think it's interesting. While on a flight to Peru a few years ago, I was seated next to a self-proclaimed atheist. He asked me why I believe in God. In the delightful conversation that ensued, I told him that I believe in God because Joseph Smith saw him. And then I added that my knowledge of God also came from personal, real, spiritual experiences. I shared my belief that all things denote there is a God and asked him how he believed the earth, this oasis of life in the vacuum of space, came into existence. He replied that in his words, the accident could have happened over eons of time. When I explained how highly improbable it would be for an accident to produce such beauty and order, he was quiet for a time and then good-naturedly said, You got me. I asked if he would read the Book of Mormon. He said he would, so I sent him a copy. I don't know who this person was or if this was even a real conversation. The responses given by this atheist are not what I would have said. <laughs> Let me put it that way. The first thing to note is that this argument that how it is improbable for the universe to come into existence without the help of a god that's an argument from incredulity. Basically, the argument is, I don't believe that could happen, so it isn't the case. And when making an argument like that, just because you don't think it's very probable doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It's not a logical way to make an argument there. The second thing I would say to this, when I dialogue with people from that believe differently than me, I like to take a Socratic approach and ask questions and try and help them better understand why they believe what they believe. Because oftentimes people don't consider very thoroughly their stances. This is, this is similar to the street epistemology method where you're just kind of asking them more, more questions to get to the root of what they actually believe. Now, even though I don't think it's a good argument for a divine creator, I would probably, in a discussion like this, concede and say, okay, let's suppose that this is a valid argument, that the world is perfectly curated and crafted for humanity. I think there is evidence to the contrary. If this world is perfectly curated and created for mankind, how could you tell the difference between a simulation that was perfectly created for us and an actual reality created by God? Let me, let me phrase that again. How could you tell that this God is not a programmer that wrote code and perfectly designed a world for us to live in the simulation? 
if this is the evidence for God, the beauty of the world, and how perfectly designed it is, what evidence is there that it isn't a simulation? Or let's say, let's say, yeah, we can tell that it's not a simulation. What evidence do you have that it's the Judeo-Christian God that created it and not the countless other gods of the world? When you get to the heart of a belief like this, it comes down to personal convictions. For me, personal convictions aren't enough to satisfy me to come to a logical conclusion of the origin of the universe. From here on, Elder Nash goes uh, tells some stories about some people that he converted. Again, these airplane stories, sitting next to somebody in an airport. He talks about how the gospel brings joy and hope to people. I get the impression through this talk that he's trying to share as many different conversion experiences from people of disparate belief systems. He talks about... Um, and, and I believe it's him making reference to Doctrine and Covenants 123. But he says, uh, Brothers and sisters, there are many among all parties and denominations who are only kept from the truth because they know not where to find it. The need to hold up our light has never been greater in all of human history, and the truth has never been more accessible. I think there's some irony here. Um, them talking about the church having the truth and them also obfuscating the history of the church. I just think that that's kind of ironic. This claim, it's, it's ironic to me that they are still making the claim that they have all of the truth and light of the restored gospel when even a cursory knowledge of the history of the church whether you believe in it or not, it presents enough evidence to show that they have not held a consistent stance on any position. So I think there's a little bit of irony in what Elder Nash is saying here. I'm not going to get, dig too much deeper into that. He just talks about sharing the gospel. The last speaker in the Saturday evening session was President Henry B. Eyring, and his talk is called The Faith to Ask and Then to Act. He talks about faith and he cites examples from the scriptures and from Joseph Smith in the methods that they talk about how to receive revelation. I don't have a ton I want to say about this talk. A lot of his belief claims and claims about their interpretation of faith and how faith works within the religion, within the organization. Nothing really jumped out at me in this one. I do have thoughts that I want to share down the road about faith and Perhaps a better way to approach faith, how we interpret new information, especially if it's contradictory to something that we already knew, and what role faith has in that sort of a process. So that's coming down the road. It has to do a little bit with this, and that's kind of what I was thinking about as he was talking, but that's going to be a whole episode on its own. So that concludes the Saturday evening session. The biggest takeaway from this that I took was, again, from Sister Sharon Eubanks' talk where she was citing how much good the church does in the world. I want to make one more comment on that. While I think the church does have a lot of money and enough to, to help solve this problem, I think it would take more than just one organization banding together. Now, while I recognize that the church could foot the bill for the majority of these expenses. Let's say, for example, if they paired up with the Catholic Church or some other organization that was also vastly wealthy, they could enact a lot of good in the world. I think it's sad that they expect so much of the membership of the church, but they do not have the same expectations of the organization as a whole. As she said, it's, it's a divine mandate from God to take care of the poor and the needy, and the church has the means to do it on a global scale. I wanted it to sit there. I wanted the listener, whether a believer or a non-believer, to sit with that information, because I think it's really telling on the direction that the church is headed. It's a contrast to the way that Christ 
lived his life. Thank you for listening today. I've got two more to go through, and those will come out next week and the following week. After that, it will get back to my normal ruminations on random subjects. I will say it's been nice to have a couple of weeks where I don't have to put a, I don't have to put a ton of thought or preparation in. I just kind of listen to the talks and share my thoughts on them. I do miss the creative outlet of preparing the episodes all on my own. So I'm, I'm eager to get back to that. And I do have a lot of ideas that have been bouncing around my head. As I mentioned, one about faith and the demarcation problem. I've got another one that I want to go into about um, being a covenant breaker. That's something that I've been thinking about a lot. I think it's a subject that is worth looking into. I appreciate you guys listening. I appreciate the reviews and the kind words that are always shared on the various outlets. Thanks for reaching out. I hope that you guys have an excellent day.